Welcome to the Homegrown Podcast. I'm your host, Liz Hazelmeyer, along with my husband, Joey. Good morning. And together we hope to educate, inspire, and equip you in your pursuit of true nourishment. Today's guest is Danielle Pruitt. Danielle is the founder of Wild and Whole, and she is a Wild Foods contributing editor for Meat Eater. She's passionate about the outdoors because hunting, fishing, gardening, and foraging enable her to connect with her food and eat conscientiously. I love that so much, Danielle. Welcome to the show. All right. Thank you so much for having me. I think we've tried to get together on a podcast for a little while now, so we're finally making it happen. We are finally making it happen, and the timing couldn't be more perfect because we're entering into Joey's favorite season of the year, (laughs) hunting. (laughs) I'm sure yours as well, Danielle. So I want to talk about all things wild game. I want to talk about hunting. I want to talk about um, all of those tidbits. But first, I just want to hear a portion of your story, how you got into Mm -hmm. being so um, drawn to nature and wanting to connect deeper to your food. Well, um, you know, it's kind of interesting. Like what I do today is I I tell people I have the best job in the world. I get to travel around, hunt and fish. Um, I spend a lot of time out in the garden and I teach people how to utilize that food that they hunt um, by butchering, processing their own meat, um, cooking. Um, Really, I just want people to have a really great appreciation um, for their food and, you know, whatever they do harvest or do do get they I want them to be able to really enjoy it in the kitchen um when they go to eat and so that's kind of like my whole thing um and it's funny that I ended up here because I I actually went to school for apparel design and manufacturing um so and and totally far from what I'm doing now but um but I would I would say that like how I ended up here is really not too far from like what I grew up with as a kid. Um, I was raised, my, my, I come from a family of farmers um, in South Dakota. My dad was a farmer um, and moved to Texas where I'm, where I'm located now. And so growing up, we had um, actually an emu farm. <laughs> I don't know if you, this was the nineties. I don't know if y'all remember the nineties and the emus. Um, it was really more of a hobby farm. Um, we didn't have a ton, but we we had enough that we were eating like emu burgers and and emu eggs for breakfast, and, and we had chickens, guinea guinea hens, and um, ducks, geese. Like w- the ducks and the geese were pretty much pets, um, and a cow, which was more of a pet too. But um, so like growing up, I I kind of always knew that like the world of protein, like meat, food was very diverse like Mm. I knew that beef chicken pork like whatever you saw is like the standard thing on a menu I knew that there was more out there Mm. and so I think that was like ingrained in me when I was really young and kind of always had a fascination for like this incredible diversity of ingredients we have in the Mm. natural world that most people would never never ever try Mm. or think of eating um and so fast forward um years later my my dad hunted and and so i i grew up around it but i never actually hunted myself um my mom didn't hunt my grandma didn't hunt none of the women i knew hunted it was more of a like the guys did it and my grandma would cook she always said you know if you clean it i'll cook it Uh, that was like her motto but I never really got out there until uh, I met my husband in college, and he is the one who who got me into hunting. Um, and we got a bird dog, and there's just that was like honestly, I think it was having Marina. She's a golden retriever. She's about to be thirteen this year, which breaks my heart. <laughs> um, there's something about watching a dog work that's like just amazing and <laughs> I, I i think i have to say like she's the reason that i wanted to be out in the field because I, I was tagging a camera along and wanting to take photos of her and it's you know after you do that so many times you want to be more and more and more involved and that it just really snowballed into into um into being a hunter what <laughs> what i do today um but but at that time um as I was cooking, I I was really starting to 
Omnivore's Dilemma had just come out by Michael Pollan. And I was really starting to question, you know, our food system, how I was eating. And I, I was also um, getting my certification for yoga, to be, to be a yoga instructor. Um, I have a very colorful resume. <laughs> um, and I, I kind of like had this moment of like, I need, I really, food is really important to me. I loved, I loved to cook and I, I wanted to find a way to, to eat more sustainably. And it just sort of hit me on the head is like, well, my husband hunts all the time. Why don't we just live off the land? Let's see if we could do that. And so we did that. Um, the first year was really tough. And I don't think we shot a deer that year. And we were doing a ton of water. We were living in North Dakota at the time. And we were doing like a ton of waterfowl hunting. And so um, snow goose basically became our staple red meat for like an entire year. Oh um, my and then gosh. we had, we, I mean, with like with lots of rabbits, lot, a variety of birds, like pheasants, um, partridge, a um, lot of fish. Um, and then some vegetarian meals to sort of tie us tie us through. But it was really like an eye opening experience that year. And we carried that on for like about nine years, ten years. We did that and um and it wasn't until I started writing my cookbook that I I wanted to sort of find a way to like encapsulate what wild and whole meant to me and what it means what su food sustainability means from the perspective of an outdoorsman, because I sure. think we look a lot at the carbon footprint of the the meat industry. And I think we, you know, the ethics of the meat industry, but we don't really look a lot at the biodiversity that happens in, in the loss in biodiversity and agriculture. And as somebody who hunts a lot, you know, that, directly impacts the wildlife and the habitats and so i wanted to write a book that really um shared that perspective and i realized how important farmers are to us as hunters and um, i mean just the way that we care for the earth and the way that we raise and grow food is so important and so i just a couple of years ago decided to start um supporting local farmers who i appreciated the way that they were raising meat and because I knew that we shared the same common goal. Right. Um, and so it wasn't until a couple of years ago that I started eating beef, pork and chicken again. Um, but up until then, it was just strictly wild game. And right now we still mostly eat wild game. But um, it is really nice to go get a fatty pork chop here and there. <laughs> mm -hmm. But yeah, that is that is such a cool thing that you guys were able to live off the land and really challenge yourselves to mm -hmm. only eat the protein that you were hunting or for, or uh, were you also foraging for like, um, I didn't forage a lot until like a couple, few years ago. Okay. And even now, I mean, I say foraging lightly, like the obvious, like chanterelles are really obvious. Morels are hard to find around here. Um, you know, berries and, and mm -hmm. things like that. Not, not enough to like really sustain you in any in any way <laughs> sure but enough to be able to recognize when you can pick up a an edible plant and, and oh yeah and yeah. incorporate that into your meal which i think is cool that's honestly something i'd love to learn more about i don't know a ton um since you mentioned it i definitely want to talk about females and hunting um joey's been wanting me to get a bow now for like a year and i'm totally on board last year for my birthday like we went to the bow shop and i like shot one that it was just like oh can you shoot a bow at 10 yards or whatever it, it was like so fun but well, I was like okay cool and um it's something I think I want to get into but I will say there's like this level of intimidation because every uh -huh. hunter I know around me is all they're all men and not saying that they wouldn't gladly invite me in but like uh -huh. what did that look like for you coming alongside your husband like how was that transformation of learning the skill mm -hmm. that he had and how did he pass that on to you you know that's a great question and I think my experience is different in the sense that I've had I've been able to start hunting in a place in North Dakota where there's a lot of public land and yeah. a lot of opportunity and hunting mm -hmm. Can, is very much like a family thing. Like everyone's kind of invited. Texas is a little bit different. 
very different. Um, and, and now I understand why I didn't hunt growing up in Texas is because I think one, I, there's not quite as much public land here. It's a lot of private. And so when you get into that territory, it becomes more of a like getting invited on a hunt or paying for a lease and it's expensive. And I think it's a lot of, it, it's, it's kind of here. It's, it's very much like a guy's thing, very much like the guys are going out. Um, and so I, I think like that location and the opportunity difference changes like sort of the dynamic of like why there's more female hunters and probably like the Midwest or the Western part of North America versus um, places like Texas. Um, but I think like getting involved, you know, I was lucky that my husband always wanted me to come like hunting for him was never like get away from the family or get get alone time or whatever it was it very much wanted me to be involved as much as possible i mean begging me to come when it was like negative 20 degrees i'm like um and i'm and i'm glad i did that and it and, and it really changed me who i am it 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 was an incredibly empowering experience um to realize that i can do this i can i can um, be more self-sufficient that that's a huge huge part of it that I think a lot of women would underestimate their ability to to be involved and I think a lot of women um, are interested in hunted hunting but either lack the resources or information to get involved or you know someone women are I hear over and over like oh I just don't think I can kill anything um, and that I mean that's a whole separate little subject in and of its own um, but I had a really good experience getting involved and a lot of support and help from people. I still haven't gotten into archery. That's one thing I've always wanted to get into. I just think I've, I've always been, I've, I've always just loved, loved bird hunting so mm -hmm. much because I think it's, I just like being with my dogs. Um, so I think you kind of fall, fall into your, your little thing of what you like to do. And, and that's really important because I think you can try out a lot of, there's, there's a lot of different ways to hunt. And a lot of different angles that you can take. And I think you just kind of got to find your your thing and what you really enjoy doing and making sure that you're doing it for the pure enjoyment and not to kill. Um, that was one of the, the biggest lessons I learned when I started hunting is that hunting is not about killing. Um, and that really changed my perspective on what it means to, to be a hunter. Mm, yeah. Well, do you want to expand on that a little bit more? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, my first year hunting, um, we, we did a lot of pheasant hunting, a lot of upland hunting. And I remember I struggled to, you know, learn to shoot a shotgun. I, I struggled to shoot birds. Um, I'd get one here or there. And there was one particular hunt. I want to say it might, might've been the last hunt of the year. I can't remember, but there was, um, a ton of snow on the ground and we were pushing this slew and usually when there's a lot of snow that those birds kind of congregate in there and they'll run through there. So you got to like push it all the way out to the end until they bust. And so we get all hiking all this long way. It's freezing cold. It's windy. I'm tired. And we get to the end and finally they flush and I miss. And I'm like, that was it. And and I just got so upset and mad. I'm like, I don't even understand the point of this. Why am I out here if I can't shoot anything? And then my husband finally said, Danielle, if you think that hunting, coming out here and doing this is about killing, then you don't understand what hunting is. Mm -hmm. And it really made me take a step back into thinking about what it is and why I'm out here. I mean, yes, I would like to put food on the table, but more than that, there there's so much more that's involved in in hunting it's it's about you know getting outside enjoying nature it's about understanding where your food comes from it's about learning the habitat everything that it takes for that animal to survive out here um and really just gaining an appreciation and so once i sort of let down the the um ex I let go of the expectations of what I wanted to get out of a hunt. I really began to enjoy it for what it is, um, being outside and mm. learning a lot about the birds 
um, the way they react, learning a lot about my dog and getting um, a really good working relationship and dynamic with my with my bird dog. Um, all these other things really fell in, fell into place. And of course, over time, you get better at shooting and, and, and it gets gets more fun. But it's it's that journey of the appreciation for wildlife that is what makes hunting so special. Mm, it's yeah. not about the trophy on the wall. Mm. That's really beautiful. I, I, I've heard Joey kind of echo similar sentiments because uh, he had one year where, man, he probably had like 150 hours in the woods and just no meat on the table. And as a mom at home with three little kids, I was like, you know, my eye was starting to twitch a little bit. Oh, I was like, yeah. are you almost done? <laughs> you know, it's like February. I'm like, we've been going since like late October, early November, you know. And um, he had to kind of explain that to me of like, hey, I want to put food on the table, but also this is part of it. I'm not grocery shopping. I'm not just going out and like I have one already, you know, pinned down, ready to go. Mm -hmm. And the pursuit of it really teaches you. I mean, I feel like the things that Joey has learned in the woods of just like patience and time alone and time to think through life. Mm -hmm even has been so helpful and so I I as the wife had to be like oh you know what that's true this this quote buffer time this wasted time sometimes it feels like before you actually harvest anything isn't wasted it's mm -hmm. it's powerful and a lot happens in that it pursuit. is we live in a really chaotic busy world and we're so wrapped up in it that we don't realize it until you just put the phone down and you're outside and it's still and it's quiet and then um and then you realize, yeah, it's it's really peaceful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'd love to hear. So after you got into hunting, how did you get connected with the meat eater um, sort of empire? Yeah. So um, like I was saying, I, after college, I worked a little bit in, in the apparel industry and realized like, oh, shit, this I don't want to do this. And um, <laughs> I wanted to like go to culinary school. Um, and I was like, not really sure if like going back to school for like another one of those trades was a great idea because <laughs> uh, I really didn't want to work in the restaurant industry. I just loved food and I loved cooking. And so I ended up actually working at a job um, doing these cooking classes and got like a really great foundation and a lot of different chefs came in. Um, and then life had plans. We moved to North Dakota and and that's when, you know, hunting became kind of a a key part of our life and I started cooking a ton and everybody said you need to make a write a start a blog um because the only meat we were eating was wild game and they were like and, and we were eating well and so everyone's like you need to like write these down like so people um can find recipes for wild game and I saw like this big gap in the market um in the wild food world where like if you're looking for a recipe like at that time like you're just gonna get a burger or a popper or something like that and I wanted to incorporate it into regular weeknight meals um something that is healthy um I mean because it was just like a normal staple in our home and um and I think like a, a lot of what was out there was very geared towards the male audience and I knew like okay, there's that many men out here hunting. How many women are there holding this meat, being like, what do I do with it, you know? <laughs> and I wanted something that would appeal to them, um, to to females as well. Um, and so I kind of came up with Wild and Hull as sort of this concept of, this is, Wild Game is the protein source, but it's also everything else on your plate, you know? Um, I, I like to, take a very whole food approach uh, to eating. So I started this blog and it was a secret and it didn't stay a secret for very long. Um, it just somehow got picked up by um, some out media outlets. And then um, I was asked to do an event at Pheasants Forever uh, that Steve was speaking at, Stephen Ranella. He is the, the creator or the founder of Meat Eater. And... Um, we just met for coffee um, one morning and he was like, hey, um, you want to join Meat Eater? This is, this was six or six years ago, maybe seven. 
And this was when Meat Eater became Meat Eater Inc., what it is today. It, Meat Eater just used to be kind of the TV show with mm-hmm. Steve. And now it's it's a much bigger company um, of an, an um, umbrella of other small brands, um, including like First Light underneath it. Um, and so, yeah, he asked me to join the company and I said, absolutely. And here we are. It's It's been a wild journey. Wild. It's it's been an incredible journey to to watch the company grow and change and to be in the room when there's just a whiteboard on the t- on on the wall and and just seeing talking about what we envision what we wanted this company to be and do and and how we're going to grow it and so it's really fascinating to be a part of it. Wow. Mm-hmm. So cool. What a cool story. I was laughing when you were like all these male hunters and then the women like they don't know what to do with it and there's a lot of wives I think that kind of are like begrudgingly cooking this game and and Mm -hmm. it's funny I was I was telling Joey earlier I was talking to another mom I said you can always tell when a when a wife's uncomfortable cooking wild game because she'll say things like do you eat the deer or like yeah do you make the deer chili and I'm like when they refer to it as deer that's when you know they're they haven't quite crossed into seeing this as a true culinary ingredient yeah it's still a wild animal to them and so I, yeah i think it's cultural too yeah like because i know there's a lot of people in the south like deer meat's deer meat it's, it's not venison it's deer meat <laughs> that's true in ohio i feel like you know venison just it it helps dress it up a little bit it brings yeah. it into the <laughs> into the kitchen a little more gracefully than mm-hmm. imagining this big clunky deer uh, but I think that's important because if you want to have a long sustaining hunting career as a male, then you better get your wife on board, in my opinion, because if yeah. she's going to be cooking it, you want to make sure she's comfortable with it. And I sure. think um, talking about the nuances, I'm excited to kind of get into that of wild game because it is different. I will say um, I have this like burning question and maybe you have an answer, maybe you don't. But uh, as I mentioned, Joey who's being very mysteriously quiet. I'm going to give him space to ask you questions in a minute, but he just got home from this big moose hunt, shot a moose with a bow, like just huge, huge accomplishment. It was training long and hard for this thing. And um, we've just been relishing in the fact that eating this moose meat, I mean, this was a big bowl. Like, That's oh, amazing. Congratulations. It, the, Thank you. It was, what was your hanging weight? Like 640? 640 pounds hanging. So, that, you know, it was probably twelve, thirteen hundred on the on the hoof, is my guess. Yeah, wow. it's, a, it's a big one, and so we're like, this gigantic moose, may, older male, you know, let's assume, has such a sweet, mild flavor. And how come the like two year grass fed beef that we have purchased has more of a quote gamey flavor than this wild game does and and is it something about like moose in particular where it's just a sweeter meat because i was looking at joey and i was like i'm enjoying this like moose steak and moose roasts and every bit of this animal and you would think you'd have the assumption that it would kind of taste gamey or it might be tough or it wouldn't Mm -hmm. be tender because it's this gigantic animal Mm -hmm. out in the woods just you know foraging for blueberries or whatever in newfoundland um, and then you contrast that with like what the domesticated cow tastes like when it's only on grass and it's on pasture, raised very humanely. But I will tell you, the flavor is is incomparable. So mm-hmm. it's almost shattering the stigma that like wild game is eh, kind of weird, but like cows are mm-hmm. are all pretty standard. So have you encountered that where you've had wild game just be even more delicious than something that maybe is? domesticated oh absolutely um I, I like to talk about this a lot um because i think you get you get all sorts of different viewpoints of people who hate the, the quote gaminess of game and i have i mean i'm pretty pretty fond of it i i think most of the time when i do eat unless it's like a really great grass-fed like um like some beef from white oak pastures that I had, like a ribeye steak or something. Like most beef I taste has absolutely no flavor to me. It, it's there's nothing to it. But like a lot of chicken, I think it tastes like water. Um, <laughs> until you like experience wild game or something that's truly, really pasture raised, you don't really get any flavor in meat 
But when it comes to wild game, the beauty of it, and, and from a culinary perspective, the thing that I've always been most fascinated with is it's like working with a different protein every single time because no two animals live the same life. We mm. are so used to domesticated animals that have sort of this routine. They're eating the same thing their whole lives. You know, if you've got a farmer living in this area, this is the grass, the same type of grass. And unless like you're someone like, you know, Will Harris, who's like, he, uh, you know, has his spring legumes and everything. Like he really fosters like different species of grasses and forbs for for those animals to change change it up, which I think adds a lot of flavor. If you're eating this one particular type of grass, you're going to get the same flavor from that cow every single time. And that's what people want when they go to the grocery store. They want to know what they're, they, they have an expectation in their head. And if it doesn't match it, they're like, whoa, that's kind of how we have been trained to eat. <laughs> and wild game live an incredible, like a totally different life. Um, you know, you've got no two deer are going to taste the same. And some of the biggest factors are definitely their food source. Waterfowl is a wonderful example of how incredibly different two birds can taste depending on where you shop them, at what point in their migration, the weather changes, what they have available to eat completely changes what they taste like Mm -hmm. and how much fat they have on them. Um, That's a really good example. Uh, but even deer, I mean, if you've ever hunted in somewhere, like I shot a mule deer in the breaks in Montana, they're eating a lot of sage, or mm-hmm. I've had an antelope from Wyoming, which I thought was the best tasting animal I've ever had, was my antelope in Wyoming. And then you've got, you know, deer from a completely different part of the U.S. living on acorns. Like you, you've got like a really different flavor profile for those two animals. And um, I think that's like the biggest thing about wild game is their food makes a big impact, but the way that they live their life also makes a big difference. Living in the mountains, the more an animal works its muscle, the more um, robust and the tougher that their silver skin is going to be, which is, is a pretty beautiful thing i mean i think we the industry for collagen and and all that kind of bone broth is so huge and yeah wild game you just have it all at your fingertips so much of it so like you know the how their actual the way they live their life changes the actual structure of the protein itself and so you get a really big diversity and i think that's what makes wild game so special Mm. joey Yes. I'm so curious to hear your thoughts. And I want you to share whatever you want to share about, you know, your yeah. hunting experience. I feel like I'm obviously the novice in this room and sitting in front of two hunters. So mm. I'm going to let you two exchange a little bit. And I, I want to hear. First comment, right, going way back was, is, I mean, I think Danielle does have like the greatest job in the world. Super, yeah. super <laughs> high envy over here. Uh, great, great amounts of envy. The, the, the first thing I wanted to, to ask is, so... It has always been a huge desire of mine to get Elizabeth into hunting, but mm-hmm. I'm very sensitive to, you know, this like hyper amount of pressure, like you're coming out with me because I, I really don't want to create an expectation mm-hmm. of some kind of enjoyment because every time someone says, you know, like, oh man, hunting, like you get to do all these like fun things. Like there's a lot of hunting, a lot of aspects to it that are not fun. I mean, you were, I mean, every story you've told us thus far about hunting is like, man, I was out in the freezing and it was like. You know, it's work, yeah. it's effort, and yeah. I was tired, and I missed, and it was disappointing. And, mm-hmm. and and for me, like, a lot of that is the beauty of hunting, right? Is that it's yeah. this imperfect experience that that I find, for me, right, a lot of my passion around hunting, I think everybody, they're, they're, they find their aspect of hunting that they love most. Mm-hmm. And I think the danger is finding the, the, like, if killing the animal is the part that you love most, that would be strange to me. Like, I, I don't... Mm-hmm me it's the preparation and the and the tactical like thinking and walking the woods for three or four hours to figure out where where are the deer or whatever animal i'm hunting moving so that Mm -hmm. i can come back the next day and the next day to kind of improve my odds 
and going out there and tinkering with your setup. And now maybe I'm going to move my blind to another part of the woods because the wind is shifting or there's mm-hmm. so many aspects to hunting that I love. And the day of where you actually harvest an animal tends to be almost just like, it's like, you know, it's, you're crossing the finish line of a marathon. So yeah, it's mm-hmm. great. But man, the memories are made in all the training runs and mm-hmm. in the, um, the parts where you remember during that race where you don't want to do this anymore. Right. And things yeah. got challenging. And I don't know that for me, that's where a lot of the, the passion um, is found. And so what I would ask is now with my kids, I've always introduced them to hunting with like squirrel hunting, something that's very quick reward. Uh, come sit with dad out in the woods on a log. And, you know, if, if you can hold still for like seven minutes, yeah. then a squirrel will come <laughs> out. Right. Um, I'm very, you know, I'm probably not going to take my, you know, eight year old in the woods in a tree stand to wait for deer anytime yeah. soon. But is there a, is there a, um, a hunt that you would say, man, this is just a, an outstanding gateway for the ladies that are listening to this. They're like, man, I just, I don't see it. I don't understand it. Um, what, would, what would be a good gateway? You know, it's hard. That's a hard question because I think it depends on where you live and what's accessible. Mm. Accessibility plays a big role. Not everyone can just pack up and go to, go to, you know, Newfoundland to shoot a moose or, <laughs> or, um, you know, in the middle of Montana, I mean, you have to get a tag and all, you know, there's like a whole other thing going on there. Um, like what is it that you have available around you? Because there's different styles of big game hunting for sure. Yes. You know, I, my dad took me to sit in a deer, deer blind a few times and, hated it (laughs) to this day i still don't want to sit in a blind i can't sit still um but if you ask me to go on a sharp tail grouse hunt or a chucker hunt and you tell me danielle you're going to be walking 10 miles i'm going to be like yes this because i like that's what i like to do i like to move i like to walk i like to find things i love spot and stock hunting because it's 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 um just for me, that's what I like to do. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, you know, it just depends on what kind of hunting is really accessible. So it's hard to say, like, this is a great introduction. Um, and I think it depends on what you really enjoy. Um, I think waterfowl could be a really interesting one. It mm-hmm. sucks because it's usually cold and wet and early, early, early in the morning. But um, there's nothing like the feeling of laying in your blind. And watching a bird, watching birds come in, cupping their wings. If you're goose hunting, just you can hear that vibration in your chest. It's it's powerful, um, especially snow goose when they're just circling above you. It's it is it is an incredible experience um, hey. that I think is really underrated. Um, but there's a lot of work that goes into waterfowling. There's a lot of decoys to haul, and it's you know all the things. Um, but I'll say like whatever you know you you want to get into whether it's upland waterfowl big game um i think that it's true to say in in any aspect in life that the harder you work for something the more you're going to appreciate it you know all you if you think about some of the greatest memories you have in life Hmm. it's there there was there were challenges you know kids are probably a wonderful example of the best thing you've ever had in your life and the most difficult thing you've ever done in your life. And I think the same can be applied to hunting. Yeah, that's so good. No, it's, I'm, I think you were worried you weren't going to answer the question, but I think you did an outstanding job answering it. And that <laughs> there's, there's, you know, finding that experience that speaks to you, right? And yeah. If, um, I, I even like how you went to the nuance of like a spot and stock hunt versus maybe a, like ambush, right? We were going to sit and wait and, um, very different aspects. And if you're someone that just wants to listen to the sound Mm -hmm. of the leaves blow and the birds chirp and nature kind of wake up around you, well, maybe that ambush hunt is something you're excited about. Mm -hmm. But if there's some part of you that wants to feel like you're working for it the Mm -hmm. whole time during the hunt, man, uh, a spot in stock. Now I, my, my experiences are far more uh, limited than, than yours, Daniel, just in the sense that most of my hunting has always been deer hunting ambush just again like you said Mm -hmm. access wise and uh, newfoundland hunting for moose is spot and stock and i'll tell you it's just so addicting i can't begin to explain Uh, driving around glassing for miles seeing moose like way out there and holding a bow and thinking okay well 
now, now the challenge is, it's like, how do we get, you know, how do you get to them? Yeah. So much closer and, you know, spoiler alert, they don't like that. Right. So it's, uh, it's, it's quite, it's quite the experience. Uh, mm -hmm. let's talk about some like processing. Yeah. Can we move on to some processing meat? So, um, harvest has, har harvest has happened and, uh, let's, let's start with, uh, like ruminants or maybe let's start with the common deer, right? Because I feel like most people tends to be the, the more, the more common uh, first big game harvest tends mm -hmm. to be, unless you're living in again, Montana, you know, Utah, Colorado, these places. Um, so people out there that want to har harvest and process their own meat, when it comes to harvesting an animal, the first question I would ask is, what do you know about this idea of like stress hormone? People talking about if you kill an animal and it's, it's really stressed, and it takes a little while to die, these sorts of things, that's going to change the flavor or the chemical makeup of the meat. Have you heard of this? What are your thoughts yeah, on it? They're, yeah, the cortisol and adrenaline going through, pumping through their blood, you know, blood is pumped through each mu muscle to send oxygen, but you're also sending hormones into it. Um, and so, yeah, I think, you know, the, one of the most important things you can do for ethical reasons, but also for, for, you know, practical reasons is to take a really clean shot. You want that animal to have a peaceful a, a death as quick as it possibly can. But, you know, I, I hear a lot of stories of, of animals, deers that have continued to did not die, ran, eat blood track, and, um, eat, you know, nobody wants that to happen, but it does happen. Mm -hmm. um, it does absolutely happen. Um, and a lot of times it affects the meat. I haven't necessarily tasted a, a difference in it, but I there's a major difference in um, its toughness. They're mm -hmm. usually a lot more tough. Um, when that happens. Um, and the same thing happens if you um, shoot a deer and there are many situations, particularly in Texas where it's incredibly hot, you got to get that deer cleaned really quickly because it's, yeah. you don't want anything to spoil and you need to get it to cool off. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of times that means you're, you're quartering it out um, while it's still in rigor, mm -hmm. which is not great. Um, you know, that muscle needs a chance to sort of get out of rigor and relax. So most of the beef that you see, you know, or have in the store have been hung or aged uh, for a period of time. And I think if you live, you know, probably where you guys are, you can haul that deer into your garage and hang it for for a few days mm -hmm. before you clean it. And that makes a really big difference. But as far as like what you're talking about with the hormones and everything, I mean, I haven't, I haven't named I don't know enough about it. I haven't experienced it enough to know that there's a difference in the taste, but I definitely think in the texture. Mm. Can you um, explain a little bit about the rigor mortis? I think I'm saying that correctly. Um, thing. I actually listened to the one of the meat eater podcasts on this. I think I like sent it to Joey's like hunting group because it was fascinating to me, and I was a little confused on the timeline. So. Like at what point, like say the animal is killed, they do stiffen up. We all know this because I've mm -hmm. seen roadkill on the side of the road. That's like looks like it's been inflated. But then there's a point where those tissues relax again. And is that the point where you're supposed to cut the meat off the bone? Mm -hmm. Like walk us through what that means for a for a very beginner. Oh gosh, I can't remember the science. I everyone, I just had a baby, and my brain has become mush. <laughs> like I don't know, I like. Everyone talks about getting their body back. I'm like, no, I need my brain back because I can't <laughs> function. Um, and I'm not sleeping very much, so that doesn't help. So I can't quite remember um, scientifically what it, the chemical reactions that are happening in the body when, when it goes through rigor. And then when it goes into this, like, the muscles let go and relax. And so basically the short answer is there's, there's a period of time it takes... Um, there's no like one set like okay this many hours after mm. there there's no set time the longer you go the more it relaxes and that's why you get like aged for like not just a few days or week or weeks you know yeah but at that point you're you're doing something different to the meat um i've noticed like with birds even just you know smaller animals 
24 hours is great. Mm. Um, with the deer in a hind quarter, I'll take, even if you can't like um, keep it whole, like what I'll do is I have like a mini fridge and I'll hang the the hind quarters and like the back straps up in, in that mini fridge and let it be in there for like three or four days. You can go up mm. to about a week. Um, once you start to hit um, that week timeline, you're kind of interfering with the, you know, the food safety of the meat. So yeah. in order to age it for a longer period of time, you have to have the right temperature and the right humidity, and you need to be really careful with that. So I'm like pretty particular with only like three or four day window. Um, but when you do want to age it, what you're aging it for for like past that point of time, it's it's not just to relax the meat and make it more tender. What you're doing is actually dehydrating it, mm. and it's losing some of that water. Sorry, I need to drink water. You're losing some of that water, and so what you're getting is a more concentrated, meatier flavor. And so that's what you're paying extra for when you're buying dry-aged meat. Mm. Yeah, that's really helpful. I think the whole we've, we've like, dabbled. Would you say what we do is dry-aging when we put it on racks? Because it's already cut off. We've done, we do two different methods. Depending on the temperature and the weather, we have some... We we were fortunate enough to gain ownership of some almost like Home Depot racking, right? So the big shelving racking that you see in Home Depot. Oh, yeah. And they were having a store close out, and we took a trailer over there and grabbed some. These things are like, I don't know, 18 feet high, and then they have like cross sections. You can kind of assemble this big shelf. We just don't put any shelves on it. It's not cute. It's very functional. It's a little but, hillbilly, but... But what we did is we took that and then we strapped it with ratchet straps on one side to an oak tree. And then we have the racking and we were able to put some gambrels on it and um, hoist our deer up. And we can get like six to eight deer on this racking. Oh, no, gosh. Wow. It's incredible. It really works very well. But when the temperature is right, we can hang our deer out there for, for our whole hunting camp. So I'm not getting six or eight deer by myself. But the um for a couple of days and so we will do that that's that's uh field dressed and then hanging um, yeah and we'll let them stay there for two three days oftentimes um maybe a little bit longer but then if we have like a really big older buck oftentimes we'll um process or, or, or debone them so skin and debone them out and then i've done a method and i want your opinion on this and please tell me i'm totally you know messing it up if i am but i'll i'll take a layer of ice in a cooler and i'll debone the meat out and i'll put it on the ice directly on the ice and then i'll utilize that as a almost like as my dehydrating method so it's all it's just big chunks of meat no bones and then we can put the cooler um tilted up on like with like blocks underneath one side of it with the tab open so the water just drains out the bottom, meaning like the meat stays relatively dry. I mean, it gets a little bit, you know, wet. And then when we pull that out of the cooler to trim it, grind it, and then, you know, vacuum seal it, put it in the freezer, it, um, it might oxidize a little bit, but um, we, ended, we, we tend to have pretty good luck doing, you know, kind of almost like aging it that way. Yeah, and and it's sort of the same concept. Um, the important thing is like trying to keep it as dry as possible. I think a lot of people like... I was worried where you were going with this because so many people are like, my method is I fill a bucket of ice, dump it in, and let it sit in the water and that it oh, brines. God. And I'm like, you're not brining it, you're oxidizing it, but water is an excellent vehicle for um, introducing bacteria on your meat. Yeah. Um, yeah. When you have water present, that means the temperature is above 32, 32 degrees yep. and and you're you're introducing bacteria it's a it's a great way to spoil your meat um mm. so as long as that ice is staying really cold and the meat is really dry like um so like we'll go to utah elk hunting and we're there for several days and we got to drive all the way back home and so you know that trans that that's a couple days 
of transportation by the time you get home and then you're ready to clean it. Like, so there's like a few days of like, it needs to be in this cooler. This cooler needs to be incredibly cold and we need to keep that meat dry. And so like, before we go, we'll put like dry ice, fill that whole thing up with dry ice. And like, you get the cooler as cold as you possibly can. Then we load our ice in and go out, like right, go where the closest gas station is and to, to like the camping area you want that as cold as you can before you put the ice in because the ice will melt if the cooler is mm-hmm. hot the ice is just gonna melt so you need that first that's the first thing we do um and then always drain that water out like you were saying and um like sometimes i'll put towels down or find like um some sort of baking grid or something to just slightly elevate it so that it's not on the ice um mm-hmm. granted if it's a deer, that can work, and you have to have a very big cooler. When you're talking about an elk, it's a big animal. There's a lot of meat. You just really don't have that luxury. Um, but, yeah, as, as long as you can try to keep it as dry, as clean as possible, um, and drain that water out, I think it's a pretty good method. Totally makes sense. I dig it. I'm wondering if we can take our fridge in the garage and do what she's talking about and almost like... Hang it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Almost like put a hook in there. Yeah, it's a really good idea. Yeah. Yeah, because it's not it doesn't have anything in it right now. No, it's, it would be great for that. It had a moose cape in it for a day, so yikers. It's um, it's I I prefer that just because you know if you're gonna hang it outside, you know you're subject to the air things in the air get blowing getting on it. Um, and you know that's why a lot of people will gut it and then hang it and keep the hide on so that the mm-hmm. meat stays clean. But I mean, there's different ways of doing it, yeah. Mm. But the refrigerator is like, okay, it's complete. It, it's for me, it's this. It's like you want to get the for like time for for like all time practicality. I want to get the deer quartered up into like animal to meat, and mm-hmm. then put it in the cooler because then I can take my time breaking it down and get to it when when I get to it. When it's still in the hide, then you're like. Now I it's gotta a bigger job. Yeah. It's and it's harder job. to skin when it's cold, I think. Especially if it freezes. There was one year where we were we, we used to have hunting land in upstate New York and this particular year, oh my gosh. It was it, icicles. They were just deer icicles. It was hanging mm. there. We, we we took you would take a deer and it would be like negative five. And and if you hung that deer overnight, it would just be frozen, the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then you go out there and, and again, just the you know fools that we were all right let's you know joey go out there skin the deer so i go out there get my knife you know and i go out there and i'm like this is just like a big block of ice yeah it was it was so challenging so we had to bring it into the garage to try to get it to thaw a little bit it was it was a nightmare i was like dipping my hands in hot water to try to keep feeling in my fingers Mm -hmm. you'd like cut yourself and like you didn't know it it was that was a nightmare situation not ideal that's tough. Nightmare situation, skinning a block of ice. Um, I would love to move into some of your favorite uh, preparations and maybe like the same question Joey asked in terms of like, okay, what's a good gateway hunt? What would be like a good gateway? It doesn't have to be meat in particular because that's going to be based on your location. But is there a particular method of cooking that you feel lends itself really well that if people maybe braise it or put it in a soup or something that it just, it, it, um, inches them closer to the idea of eating wild game that's maybe a little bit more attainable than like a burger or something you know i this is a hard question um i think when you get into the territory territory of soups and braises i think the purpose of that is to tenderize and break down the meat so you, mm. you've got something really tough with lots of collagen which is good stuff you want all that in in that soup or that braise to tenderize. And after, you know, four hours of cooking, it's going to really take on all the flavors that you've got in the pot, whatever mm-hmm. else you, whatever else you've got in there. And I think that's a good way to experience meat um, texturally because I think it's different than domestic in that wild game has way more silver, t- tougher silver skin than than beef or or whatever like you know say you're gonna make osso buco for an example it doesn't take that long to 
I, I don't think it takes that long to do it with a cow. But if you're using a deer, depending on the age and the life that deer has lived, you're looking at four to six hours. And I think that's really hard for people who are used to cooking with beef being like, thinking that a two hour cook time is a long time. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, whereas a venison, it's much longer. Um, and, but the reward is that you're getting like a richer, silkier, like succulent, um, viscosity to the braising liquid that I think is really nice. But I think if you wanted somebody to like embrace wild game for the actual taste of the animal, I would always say, you know, take something that's really tender and just like sear it, salt and pepper, um, mm -hmm. cook it that way. Um, I really, really impartial to pan roasting, which is where you basically start on the stovetop in an in a oven-proof skillet, or it doesn't actually have to be an oven-proof skillet, in a skillet, giving it a really hard sear on the outside just to, to develop flavors. And then you transfer it in the oven, stick a thermometer in there so you know when it's going to be ready and when it's going to be done. You don't have to worry about overcooking it. And then that oven is circulating air more evenly and it's going to cook more evenly. And you can turn that temperature of the oven down really low um, to help mitigate moisture loss so it stays juicier. And that has been like the kind of cooking technique that I go to over and over and over again for its simplicity in itself. But you've also got the benefit of like, okay, this thing is now in the oven. Um, you can... You can add all these other ingredients or make a pan sauce in that in that pan that you just seared the meat in um, to sort of elevate and do other things with it. And it kind of almost becomes a one pot meal, but in a very elegant way that's mm -hmm. not like a stew. Mm, yeah, that's a great, great tidbit. I'm going to do that more with our moose. I made a steak the other night and I was cooking it for some family. And after I just did it in a cast iron roll hot, I left it. I left it pretty rare. Actually, my family members were like, can I throw that back in the pan? Let's be sure. <laughs> but um, at the end of the meal, my sister-in-law was like, so what do you like season this with? Like salt and pepper and spices? I was like, just salt. And Joey was like, it's what it is. Like it mm -hmm. just needed a kiss of salt. I did have some butter in the pan that I was kind of, um, what do you call that when you're? Basting it. Base, yeah, I was basting it with butter just because moose was is so lean and I wanted mm -hmm. to add some fat into that. But man, when you have a really fresh, clean piece of meat, a little salt and pepper, a little, mm -hmm. little um, pan sear, oh, it's so good. I love that. I think if I was going to interject into that and just a little bit from a culinary perspective, and again, Daniel has so much more experience with wild game than I do, but the only thing that I would encourage people if they're worried about wild game is, is learn the, the similarities and the nuances of wild game meat. It's, it's going to look different, but you can find similar cuts of wild game to what you're already preparing. So if you're cooking at home already and you're like, man, I'm really familiar with like a New York ship steak. It's like, well, why don't you grab a backstrap um, and cook it exactly the same? It's going to be smaller in most cases. And it's going to be um, leaner mm -hmm. in most cases, but you can prepare those meats in, in a similar way. So if you're working with an eye of round, it, it, you can find that same thing on a deer, right? So I just, I just think that that would be one way to help yourself consider if I'm going to use this, because the, often the questions that I get are, uh, what do I use this for? Mm -hmm. You know, hey, I've got this mm -hmm. meat, what do I use it for? I'm like, well, you would whatever you've always done it's this is the same this is the same world yeah. that we're living in this is just me and so um i think that uh not being afraid of of it being a little bit smaller but also um if you've got a roast like right if you've got like a venison hindquarters and you want to utilize that for either it could be burger it could be you want to take it and convert it into jerky but maybe you've just got the whole roast and you want to turn it into a like a pot roast or something like that mm. it's, it's it's very similar and i would encourage people that you can do the same thing with it you may want to introduce fat like you were talking about mm -hmm. but um but yeah i think that's that's what i would say yeah that's i get that question all the time people ask what do i do with this cut what do i do with that cut um and i really want to sort of demystify wild game for people and simplify it by saying okay imagine that there's only two ways of cooking it 
that meat is either going to be tough or it's going to be tender. Mm. If it's tender, cook it hot and fast, mm. like a steak. If it's tough, low and slow. And that's all you need to know. That's so um, good. There's just two ways of cooking it. Um, and that's really oversimplifying it, but I think it helps people wrap their head around around that much more easily. I think that's powerful, though. Mm-hmm. Say, you know, hey, if it's going to be tough, you know, low and slow, tender, hot and fast. I that's totally me. I mean, I need. I think oversimplification is really helpful, and just because it's easy and quick to remember. Of like, okay, I, I, I'm pulling out this particular. It's all labeled. It, it was like, yeah, moose eye round, or like moose roast, or the brisket was like the size of of the chair. It was. I was like, how are we mm-hmm. going to cook this? We don't even own a that's, pan big enough. That's awesome. Throw it in the smoker or something. That's what I want to do. Uh, that's what I like. Um, so that's, I like that little, uh, I'm going to use that phrase from now on. Um, mm-hmm. I love that. Is there, are, are there things right now that you are excited? You have, you said you haven't gotten into archery yet, but like, are there things in the hunting and outdoor space that you're excited to learn new skills in or embark upon? I know you're also like freshly postpartum. So you're in this like new mom phase, which is definitely, I'm so curious to hear like how you're going to incorporate hunting season maybe this year if you're going to pause or whatever but Mm -hmm. what new things are you excited to to learn yeah i'm i'm interested to see how i'm incorporating hunting and fishing as well i've got high expectations um so far things have, have been a little tough but um he's still very young um the so we now live on the coast i live in rockport texas um it's kind of by corpus christi corpus christi It's a small, fishy little town that I just really love. Um, We spend a lot of time out here fishing for redfish, and I'm pretty good with traditional tackle. Um, Not as great with a fly rod, and I've I've been taking some. I've had some um, lessons in the past for for fly fishing. It's fishing on the on the coast is different than river fishing. Not it's not the same as like fishing for trout on um it's it's a little bit different and your cast is just slightly different as well um and it's much much windier mm-hmm. um so you you have to know how to double haul and that's what i'm currently working on right now is my double haul um but we we really enjoy sight casting redfish with on a fly rod is um it's kind of like the same you know if you were to compare it to deer hunting um Using traditional tackle for fish that you can't see, you know, it's mm-hmm. is is kind of like sitting a blind, and then sight casting is kind of like spot and stock in a way because you literally are watching the birds, figuring out where the birds are, and finding where the fish are, and then the water is clear so you can see, and and then you can find the fish, and so it's all about getting that right cast. And just dangling that fly just across the front of his nose Mm. and just watching it turn and just grab it is really, really fun. Um, And so that's kind of the thing that I'm kind of getting into now is a little bit more saltwater fishing. As a novice fly fisher, what is a double haul? Because I've I've Um, been fly fishing, but I've always done river. So Montana, Wyoming, and I'm... Four years in, so I'm getting like I can do it now. I guess is the way mm-hmm. I would say it. But what is it? What is a double haul? Oh gosh, I don't know if I can explain it more than it's it's a movement with your hands. Of so when you flick the fly rod back, uh-huh. you know, with your left hand, you're pulling down and it's going back because you're creating tension. Yeah, yeah. To whip it forward, double haul. When you move forward, you're you're bringing it back up. You're going back down. Because you have to keep the tension on both sides so that, because you've got to cut through the wind, not just in the okay. back, and, but in the front. That's mm. what, people who are listening are probably like, she did a terrible job explaining. <laughs> um, again, I'm learning. I am learning. <laughs> um, it's a tactic to cut, cut through the high but winds. But it's definitely yeah. like a, a child, my husband's really good at it. He's like, it's like playing the violin. I'm like, you don't know how to play the violin. Like, what do you, you know, <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> Um, but it's it's this coordination movement that just takes a lot of muscle memory. Um, and then because like you, you get outside and you're practicing in the yard, you're like, I can do this. And then you see the fish in front of you and you're just like, I got to get it out there as quick as possible. And like, you know, your fly line just swirls down in front of you and you're just, yeah, it's hard. 
it's fun. It is so hard. It it's is hard. so hard. <laughs> Live fishing is is definitely t challenging. I, I do also like it a lot because even if I'm not catching anything, it's almost like a there, there's a skill to it. Being able to cast correctly, mend correctly, you know, find the streams, find the holes, find the areas that you need to be in. And I've never done salt water, but uh, in, in a river, it's, um, it's if you're floating or if you're wading, either way, there's 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 little nuances to fly fishing that are mm -hmm. that are really fascinating to learn and get better at. And even if you're not catching anything, you can kind of be like refining that craft. And then when you yeah. do catch something, it's like, oh my gosh, it worked. You're almost like really shocked. Like, oh my gosh, I've got yeah, some gum. I would say forget. like that time, like on the river, I've only done it a handful of times in Montana and it's very subtle. Like there's, you're, as somebody who doesn't fish a lot, when you go out there for the first time, you, you it's, you see something from the surface and you're like, there's nothing happening. Um, but until you really start to, slow down and tune in to the real subtleties of what's the little babbling and movements of the water like you're talking about finding those holes until you realize like wow there's like a whole world down here like movements and things happening that you have to like pay attention to um i think i think that's interesting I'd love to, before we talk about your cookbook a little bit, I'd love to talk sort of content creation. I remember um, you guys put out a stunning video series with Wild and Whole. Um, and I know that you visited various places. I, think, I believe you've gone to White Oak Pastures and talked mm -hmm. to Will Harris too. And so I'd love to hear if you have any stories from from that of just things that have really stuck out with, stuck with you or stuck out to you in experiencing sort of like in the field movement of meeting with these farmers or like uh, I watch you like die for lobsters or whatever you were doing. <laughs> that I, wouldn't, I didn't want to do that episode, but <laughs> I did. <laughs> but it's this it's really beautiful content. And uh, I'm curious sort of some of the behind the scenes and, the, and what that felt like and looked like for you as you were living through that. Uh, so the series you're talking about, um, it's called Sourced for people listening on youtube there's i think we did two seasons of four episodes each and it was really so much fun because they were the the show is like i want to go source my own food because that's really what i do every day in my real life but like i now have the opportunity to go to places that i've never been and try totally different things and um and so there were some really, really cool things that like I've always wanted to do. You know, we talked about aging for a minute. Um, I got to go it, to California um, to catch fish with uh, someone named Lee Wei. He is the first dry aged seafood monger in the United States. Hmm. And so his whole thing is taking the same concepts with beef applying it to seafood and fish. And he has dry aging chambers and where he ages his fish. And so you're you're not only producing a better quality product of the fish, but you're also extending the shelf life of fish, mm. which if you, you know, something I'd never really thought about before. Most people think fresh is the best. I want the boat fish off the boat. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot of waste in that commercial seafood industry because people want the freshest thing they can. And so what he's been able to do is like really increase that shelf life. Um, and, and make less waste. And I thought it was really fascinating the way he did it. And not just from a commercial standpoint, but as somebody who catches their own fish, learning how to better take care of it. I, you know, we talk, you hear a lot about that in the hunting industry for people who do hunt deer. Like what can, what principles can we take from farmers and meat butchers and processing, you know, how they handle beef? How can we apply that to venison? And so this was a really interesting way to to think about that with fish that I catch. How can I um, extend the shelf life? And now, you know, I'll go like three or four days without eating the fish we caught. And it tastes probably, I would say probably better than the day that you caught it because yeah. of the texture changes that happens with it. Um, as long as you're doing it the right way. Um, that was a fascinating episode. Um, another fascinating one was I went truffle foraging. Um, we went 
to Washington first and had a dog to do native wild truffles. And then we went to a treffery for um, other truffles. Um, what else have I done? Um, turkey hunting in Tennessee. The spiny lobster diving, the, they asked me to do... I didn't want to do that one. I, they were like... <laughs> there, there was somebody... There was a girl we wanted to highlight, and she liked diving. And despite living on near the water, I don't. I like to be above the water. I don't want to be in the water. <laughs> uh, I'm not a water girl. And so they were like, "Okay, you know, you're gonna need to take free diving lessons before you go, and all this stuff." Because I mean, I think at one point we were free diving 25 feet for some Whoa. of these. Like, it, and this is my first time I've ever done this. I'm like, what? Well, what like I'm supposed to just go down there and 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 so like I had um so that as much as I didn't want to do it it was one of the more challenging things that I had done because I I um you your free diving is you're having to really slow your heart rate down and you're really practicing your breathing and as somebody who loves doing yoga I really found myself um, attracted to that aspect of it, um, really just concentrating on the breath. And so when you're out there and you're diving um, and holding your breath, like trying to keep that heart rate slow and the, the whole thing, it's it's a mental trip. It's it's like all a mind game because um, mm -hmm. the moment you start freaking out, um, things go wrong. Um, yeah. You, you want to go right back up. And so you so it's. It's, it, that was really, really crazy. Um, and so, like, I I was able to actually get a handful of lobsters and dive down. Most of the lobsters, I got down to 25 feet and started netting some, and they escaped my net, and I was like, I give up. And then, the, and so we moved to, like, 15, 20 feet, and then that was just enough um, to, to get me down there, stay down there for long enough to get them out of the hole, net them, and then come back up. Um that was a really cool episode. Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably why it stuck out in my head because I, I mean, I watched that maybe two years ago when it first came out, and um, I like if you can just pause and think about the deepest part of your pool is probably maybe nine or twelve feet, and you're talking like you're going down to twenty five feet, like that's and you have no equipment. There's no, you know, you're just down there. You're not mm -hmm. with an oxygen tank. That's what free diving yeah. is, and so. And then on top of that, you're trying to harvest a food. It's mm -hmm. it's a wild, I'm sure you're right, such a mind game experience. So that's really yeah. cool. Um, I, yeah, I think w just watching you kind of go into all of those different settings and spaces was cool because you are really like when I think about a female embodiment of what it is to like be outdoorsy and, and connect to your food in a way that's not just homesteady or not just agriculture, right? It's it's beyond that. Um, mm -hmm. You're the person that pops in my head when I think of like who that quintessential person is. And so it's really been fun to watch you and your journey as you've done all of these different forms of content. Um, so Thank I want to talk about, yeah, of course, I want to talk about your cookbook. And um, first of all, how intense is it writing a cookbook, but also like share with us your your vision behind it and um some of the things that you love about it yeah so i um started this book proposal probably i can't remember when it's three or four years ago i have moved twice and had a baby since starting to, <laughs> since starting this Bless book you. so that's how long it has been in the making um but yeah i think you know i had some publishers reach out to me about writing a book and and i think it was about the second or third publisher that reached out that I was like, I need to put a proposal together because people are interested in, in this idea and in, in this lifestyle. And I knew right away that the hook was less, I mean, the recipes are important because it's a cookbook, but I think what was more, what, what the hook was is that this was more of a lifestyle of how to, of, of how you can approach your food um, and what eating consciously means. And so I knew mm. right away that this book was, the foundation of this book was all about my journey into discovering what it means to eat consciously. 
And it's not just about wild game and wild foods, but it's about that interconnectedness between the food industry and agriculture, um, foraging, gardening, all of the things. I think we really, I think, I think most people look at all those things in, in like tunnel vision really easily when if you just go from like a bird's eye view and see things in a very holistic perspective, um, you start to sort of see the earth and the world as this one ecosystem that we are a part of. And there are an incredible amount of ingredients in which to eat food from. Um, and I wanted to just find a way to capture that as a whole. And so I wanted to kind of guide the book through the seasons because that's kind of the way that I, I live my life and, and how I am able to get this diverse range of food is is staying really in tune with what's happening in nature throughout every single season. Because every single season, there's something really amazing. Um, something is migrating, whether it's waterfowl migrating in the winter or in the fall, or right in the cen center of... Um, hmm, the migration for pollinators and and butterflies and it's like paying attention to like all these like rhythms and in, in nature that are happening and then it's like i see i see this happening i know the dewberries are popping up and then i know like all all these different things that are happening in the garden and and um it, i just think it's it's an amazing way to approach food and to be able to get outside and connect to your food mm mhm mm yeah, really tuning in. I like how you have kind of a cover page for each season and you just have like three word, three or four words for it um, in the book. And I remember that's one of the first things I noticed as I was flipping through it of just like summarizing these beautiful seasons. I think so many people are like, oh, I live for summer. And I'm like, I don't. I live for <laughs> fall and I love for I live for winter and I live for spring. Like I love every season in, it, in its own like uniqueness. Mm -hmm. um i love that cool danielle will you please tell people where they can find you and connect with you so my book is available wherever books are sold um you can get them through the meateater.com which is the company that i work for um my local bookstore in san antonio i used to live in san antonio i just moved. Mm. called nowhere books you can order online and of course you can order on amazon mm -hmm. Cool. Your Instagram handle, Danielle Pruitt, and then we'll tag everything below so people can find you and connect with you. Do you have a mm -hmm. website as well? Do you have a blog that they can Everything is on the Mediator website. Okay, cool. Perfect. Find her YouTube channel. That that um, show we were talking about is called Source. Yes. Go, find mm -hmm. that on, go watch that for sure mm -hmm. on YouTube. Oh, it's so good. Oh, my goodness gracious. I don't think I've seen season two. I wonder if I've only seen season one now. Okay. Yeah. That's on the on the docket that... yeah it's gonna be my friday night binge sesh thanks danielle yeah. i can't wait season two is the one where i went to white oak pastures yeah then i haven't watched that yet ah oh, that makes that me was, so excited that was a really fun one too i like that. you know we will harris will... is fantastic <laughs> he's my favorite human we've had him on the show twice and the last time we talked to him was a few months ago and i was like hey we really want to bring our family down we have a daughter who like wants to be a farmer and he's like please come down. You know, we'd love to host you. Gotta figure it out. I just wrote this morning in my notebook, like my goals for the next six to 12 months. I literally wrote visit White Oak Pasture. I was like, I'm going to do it. We're going to take this tiny little baby to White Oak and we're going to go. So um, I can't wait to watch season two of Source. Cool. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. This conversation was so like practical, but also philosophical. And I loved just getting to get to know you a little bit better. So thanks so yeah. much for being here. Thank you so much for having me on. Um, you guys are great. I love what you're doing. Um, so this has been an honor. Oh, thanks. And congrats Until on that time. moose. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. <laughs> Y'all are going to be eating that for a long time. <laughs> I, I hope so. I love it. And with that, Danielle Pruitt has left the virtual chat. Mm -hmm. You always pause right after that. I always think you're going to say something more. Are you waiting for me to talk? I was... I don't really know what I was doing. Here's the outro, guys. Listen, this we're a very professional bunch. Very All right. professional. Um, what a great show. It's uh, it's always fun to have someone. Like, when I say we've been trying to get her on the show, I think it's been a year and a half that we've had various, like, dates scheduled to record, and then just things have come up either on our end or on her end. And But I really feel like this timing was so perfect because it's right in the middle of hunting season. 
Um, we got to talk about some fun current events and uh, what a great conversation. She's just such a pleasant human being. And Absolutely. I, I love everything she's doing. And Definitely go check her out. Go find her book. This is it. If you're watching this, this is her book. It's stunning. It's really thick. Joey saw me flipping through this morning. He's like, are you reading the Bible? And I was like, I'm reading through the It was book. far off. I was like, what do you got there? You know? But, you know, yeah, it's fantastic. She, she starts out the book kind of giving you a whole synopsis of like, why she's so passionate about connecting to our food, which I obviously very deeply resonate with. Mm-hmm. So I love that. Bless her on her uh, new motherhood journey and go give her a follow. Absolutely. Friends, if you've been here before, you you know everything we've got going on. If you, if you don't, we have a lot of things that we do to help you on your real food journey. Uh, first and foremost, man, this episode today for me is really powerful because I believe there is something that is super centering grounding insert term here on your real food journey about hunting and this this effort towards self-sustainability self-reliance it is so good and it's so powerful and i highly recommend it you know what i'd love to see is i feel like in 2020 and post 2020 we really saw like a big homesteading movement which i love and fully support i think that's great but that's more about like cultivating your land and like having domesticated animals but and we have always talked about like oh is that our future someday we don't know but then also like what if there was like a a boom right of like hunting and wild foraging and things like that where you don't have to necessarily uproot your family you can stay in your home but you can also engage in some of the wildlife around you i think that's a cool maybe we could Hunting and fishing, there's just there's not, there there are opportunities, and to Danielle's point, there is some realities behind land access, water access. Totally, it's not as simple as as you know, go out in your backyard and and you know, arrow something and and cook it up on the grill. But it is definitely an effort, and it's it's a worthy effort, in my opinion, to figure it out whether your situation is finding public land or putting in for tags or traveling there there are ways to figure it out and it's, it's it oftentimes takes more effort than just the old-fashioned you know i walked into my backyard woods and some people have that reality and that's amazing and you should definitely utilize it if you do once you do get into the to the hunting game you know you're you're gonna probably want to learn how to cook that meat <laughs> and therefore you know daniel's book will be outstanding if you're already hunting man this book is definitely for you um, it's stunning. Let me, um, there was a recipe on here. I just wanted to call out because even if you're like, I don't really eat a lot of meat, um, giant duck fat chocolate chip cookies. I was like, can I use bacon fat? First of all, I'm thinking about it, but there's like, she, there's the way that she's incorporating all different kinds of animal parts. It's not just like a bunch of roasts and stews. Like she's got amazing stuff on here. So it's also just a stunning book, so it's like a great like coffee table in your kitchen kind of thing. Go grab it. Additionally, we have pro- products, resources, and things for you to keep you in that real food game. One, keeping you inspired, educated, and equipped to pursue this journey because the, the journey is tough. And the journey is long, and it takes a long time, and we want to accelerate your experience to get you confident. One of the ways we can do that for you is through our real food guide. Mm-hmm. Created a guide to establish some kind of pillars or guiding principles within real food that can help you make the best decisions with where you are, what your context might be. Uh, This is not a uh, laying out a perfect plan that you can follow to a T and more of a equip you to take care of yourself. And that's kind of our objective here is to create a bunch of self-sufficient folk that are capable of making amazing decisions for them and for their families. Um, that's why it's called homegrown education. Right? Mm. So this is not a, here's the plan. It's a, here's how you can go out and do this for yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, we've also got curriculum for your kids to teach them, kind of get them started on this program, this journey early. You can go find all these things and more. Some stuff that we have is paid. Some stuff is free. It's on our website, homegrowneducation.org. We also, uh, in case, you know, you're confused. We have a podcast. You can share that with people. Uh, this is uh, the Home Run Podcast. It is free for all. We have a paid version where we discuss more nuanced topics, more in-depth kind of current events, these sorts of things. It's a Substack channel. You can find that at Substack. 
backslash homegrown education. Our recent show, we talked about the Surgeon General's warning that parents are super stressed out. And we kind of gave like our two cents and... It gets a little bit more spicy maybe than... It's a little more. It's just... It, it, yeah, but like we've also had other conversations on there too. So it's it's a it's, it's a fun time. It's a fun time. Go check it out. Uh, that is paid and we utilize the payments from that to help support keeping this going. It, uh, a lot goes into this podcast to make it happen. Mm-hmm. We've also got a retail store called Hazelmeyer Goods, mm-hmm. where we sell you products and things for your home to take care of you and take care of your household. Lard dish soap being a primary thing on that site for you. If you have not gotten into dish soap that is in a block form, mm-hmm. uh, you're like behind the game. It is. It is really important right now as the weather is changing because if you're one of those people who you wash a bunch of dishes and you're using that liquid soap and it is drying out your hands because of all the surfactants and dissolvents and grease fighting, you know, quote, things in there, you know the pain of like cracked hands and then you have to go reach your hand into a hot water and then like scrub a soapy pot. It sucks. So I haven't had to deal with that in three years because we use this solid large dish soap that we made ourselves for a long time, but then also brought on a soap maker. And I don't deal with the dry cracked hands anymore. And that's like such an underrated point of using solid dish soap. Not only is it completely plastic free, you're utilizing what's otherwise considered like a waste product. You're able to just have a really clean like three ingredient soap. It smells nice. It doesn't have a scent to it, but it just has like a soapy like essence. It's it's what soap would smell like. There's there's no scents. There's no fragrances whatsoever, but it's mine. And functionally, being able to apply soap directly to your cleaning instrument, which we recommend our brushes that we also sell that are horsehair, maple wood, no plastic brushes. Can you see the trend here? Okay. Um, but even if you have a favorite brush at your house, it's fine. You apply this soap directly to it. And then you scrub your dishes. And so you're not like dumping it into a bowl or to a pan. And you don't really know how much to use. Yeah, there's no way. The portion control here for soap distribution is extremely effective. And I'm a big fan. Hey, Lard Dish Soap, shopdh.com. Got that for you. Go check it out. We've also um, got tea, coffee, home care products, sourdough tools, all that stuff on that site. Go check it out. Get you some. If you want to hear more from us, because man, you just haven't heard us talk enough. You can find us on Instagram. I'm at Joey Hazelmeyer. Elizabeth is at Liz Hazelmeyer at homegrown underscore education. And friends, until next time, that's a wrap.